love him and adore him. Praise God. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. Anybody else feel it? Feel the Spirit of the Lord in the house. Praise God. What a great God we serve. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise. And we want to give him all that is due unto his name. There's nobody like our God. Nobody like our God. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. You're already standing. Let's stand for the honor of the word of the Lord. There's some customs that I just appreciate us continuing respecting things of God. I won't ever get to the place that I treat the house of God, the people of God, or the things of God casually. I want to treat them with the utmost of respect and honor and uh, make sure that they are holy to me, holy things. Out of the book of John, chapter 20, if you'll turn there with me tonight. I've had something in my spirit for a couple of weeks. Yesterday, um, I think it was yesterday or Friday, one of the two, uh, I had a pretty direct confirmation of it, told my wife about it, but um, just want to follow the Holy Ghost tonight. Some things, it's not my business why God wants it, I just want to do what God says to do. John chapter 20, go down to verse 24 begin reading but Thomas one of the twelve called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came the other disciples therefore said unto him we have seen the Lord but he said unto them except I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails thrust my hand into his side I will not believe And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus. Aren't you glad when Jesus shows up? Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hand. And he reached hither, and, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered unto him, said unto him, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Except I shall see in his hands, verse 25, the print of of the nails Thomas said I'm not going to believe I want to preach to you from this title it's the title of an old song the name of it is I shall know him I shall know him Jesus I pray that you would help us tonight as we take a moment just to look into the word of the Lord um, to draw ourselves closer to your side Lord, I wish it was possible that we could sit down at your feet. Lord, that we could sit down on that seashore in front of you. I wished it were possible, God, that we could be in the crowd when miracles were done, when loaves and fishes were spread. I wish we could hear your voice. But God, to us, it's, it's more blessed to believe and to not see. But I pray that you would help us to feel close to you and speak to us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and you may be seated. Scripture is very clear when it says that no man hath seen God at any time. No man has ever been able. Our eyes are not sufficient. We are too limited in all of our ways to be able to glimpse into the glorious nature of God himself. Of course, you remember how with with Moses, just a glimmer of the glory of God literally blinded him 
and they had to put a veil over his face just so others could handle the afterglow of the presence of God. I want you to know until we get a glorified body, we couldn't handle what God is in his fullness. He's a marvelous God. But in the book of Genesis chapter 1, the Bible talks about how that God made man in his own image. That's how he made man. He fashioned man in the image of God. And then we get into the book of Hebrews chapter 1. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was the express image of God. Now the word express means an exact duplicate. In other words, uh, it's, it's when a die is cast. You have a coin and it presses down into that and it leaves an impression of what was in that die. And the next one comes and it's an exact replica again of the one. That's what the, literally the word meant when he talked about the expressed image is that when you see or saw the face of Jesus, you were literally looking into the perfect man that God intended humanity to be. Anybody else believe he was perfect? Amen. Jesus told Philip, he said, when you see me, Philip, you've seen the Father. And then he went on and explained it, said, the Father and I are one. Uh, There's no separation When you see me, I am the literally embodiment of the the image of God itself. Now, Jesus uh, left behind no visual record of what he looked like. None whatsoever. There's no artwork from that original first century. There's no, no bit of of mosaic, there is nothing, no sketches, no one sat in the crowd and sketched him out. Um, there, there was nothing like that. It, it just was no simple record whatsoever of what he looked like. Anything that we can imagine, anything that our art, artists can imagine would simply be speculation, trying to figure out what do we think that Jesus looked like? There's a discussion online uh, after I outlined my message. There was a discussion online of what Jesus looked like. One thing I can tell you of what Jesus looked like. He did not look like the effeminate uh, face that the Renaissance artists in the 14th, 15th, 16th century painted him to be. My God is not a sissy. And he didn't look like a sissy. And that's just not the way that it was. He's not effeminate in any way, fashion, because if you want to look at an image of a man, I think he was the perfect image of a man. Somebody say amen. Now, one of the things that they do is they give him long hair. Well, let me just tell you something that was, and according to the scripture, a shame for a man to have long hair. It was not the culture of the day for men to have long hair. Go back in history. You know, go back in your history books. Go back, go back to the things of Rome back during that period of time. The senators, the Roman empires. How many of them did you see with long hair? The culture of that day did not have long hair. As a matter of fact, it was a Jewish custom that the men would cut their hair at least once a month. It's just the way it was. So Jesus would not have long hair. Uh, Everybody has supposed that he had a beard. Again, it's a rare thing in that day for men to have uh, beards on their face during that period of time. Uh, There were pictures drawn of the captivity of the Jews in 70 A.D. And some of those captives had Jews. But you are a captive, you're not going to have your shaving kit around. Not that they used Gillette back in those days. But you, you wouldn't have access to any way to take care of yourself. 
And so obviously some things would have happened. But if, if you did see a picture of Jesus, you would have seen him as, an, as a perfect in, a man that was of Jewish lineage. That's just who he was. The Bible said there was nothing special about him, no beauty about him that we would desire him. There would have been nothing like that that just would have made you sit there and stand in awe of that because that is what men value. But God obviously made him in that perfect way that God would have valued him. Now, in all of that, there were ones that walked with him. There were those that talked with him. There were those that fellowshiped with him. But there was no record. John, as close as John was, doesn't tell us that he was about 5 feet 10 inches tall. He doesn't tell us that he had certain hair color. He doesn't tell us whether it was curly hair or straight hair. There is no record of anything like that whatsoever to, to get a perfect image of what he looked like. The two, you remember, after the resurrection, the two on the way to Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus, uh, Jesus joined himself with them, and he asked them, what are you guys talking about? And so they began to tell him what they were discussing, the recent events, the crucifixion that just took place in in Jerusalem and, and how that their hopes were all wrapped up in that but but he would been he had been killed and that he had been buried and, and they're talking about all these things, their broken hopes and their broken dreams. And Jesus went back into the Old Testament and he began to teach them about who Jesus was from those times. And they said afterwards, did not our hearts burn within us? But it amazes me that these two men that were disciples did not recognize Jesus until Jesus prayed and revealed himself. They did not realize who it was that was standing before them. How can that be possible if you're a disciple? How could it be possible Unless they didn't know him all that well. One of those peripheral people. One of those that hurt him occasionally. But didn't have the depth of intimacy with Jesus. I don't want a relationship where with, if Jesus showed up, I could not recognize him. I would hate to be in a relationship and to find out that I was so unmemorable, but they could not tell the nuances of my voice, the appearance of my physique, the color of my hair, the color of my eyes. I would hope that that one that loves me knows me the best. Somebody shout amen. Jesus was talking one time about the dividing asunder of the goats and the sheep, the ones on the left and the ones on the right. He talked about, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. And then he used these words, for I never knew you. They said, but Lord, we did many mighty works in your name. We did all of these things in your name. They, they claimed a relationship. But obviously it wasn't there. Because the Lord did not know them. The word know there is not just that simple foreknowledge of God. Because God knows all things. You can't hide that from God. But it is referring to that relationship when he called them workers of iniquity what he was literally saying was what you did you did for your own selfish purposes 
Iniquity is when you twist truth to fit your own self. I wish I could get that in your mind where you understand. Anytime somebody takes a scripture and they begin to manipulate the scripture so that it fits them rather than them fitting the word, it is iniquity. When somebody can woo a crowd and they do it for money, it is iniquity. When they use it for their own gain and their own good, it's for iniquity. It is the spirit of Simon that said, give me this power that I could do this. And, the, and, and, and Peter said, looked at him and, and said, you, you, you're so far, Simon, from the things of God. You, you're, you're evil in your intent because you want it for your own self. You're not caring about his cause, his ways, his thoughts. Remember, Peter himself one time denied, told the Lord it wasn't going to happen like the Lord said it was going to happen. And the Lord looked at him and said, Satan, get thee behind me. Told John James one time, said, you don't know what spirit you're of. You don't realize. You're not quite picking up my heartbeat. You, you haven't spent enough time in that place where you have watched for the nuances of my language. My... There was no intimate knowledge of him, no closeness to that. When you get to know somebody, when you get to really know them, you get to know everything about them. Now, this is going to sound really crass and really bad, but when you're newlyweds, you have all kinds of weird things going through your brain. When you got a, your first baby, it doesn't happen with the second one. Sorry, Dustin. It only happens with the first one. You worry about whether they're going to have six fingers. Hello, somebody. They're going to have... You know, they're going to have a droopy eye. You see them come out of the womb, the first thing you think is, oh, my God, what's wrong with them? Mama doesn't. Daddy does. You, you, you just have all kinds of fears. One of the weird th fears, that we, it's probably because we've read too many detective knowledge, uh, novels where, where the detective and the family member has to go to the morgue to identify somebody. Their face is all blessed, messed up. You can't recognize who they are by that. But they've got, to, they've got to pull back the sheet. And you've got to be able to say it is or it isn't just because of the physical nature of the body. I think one of the things my wife decided was I had a, I had a wart or growth right back here on my back, you know. She'd just say, hey, roll him over. Let me see if that spot's on his back. She got worried it was cancer. I had it cut off so she can't recognize me from my backside now. Well, anyway. When you get to know somebody, you get to know the tone of their voice. You get to know when there's that certain tone, when they're saying one thing but they're meaning something else. You get to know when you're sitting across the table from them and they just lift that eyebrow a little bit. What they're saying, the twinkle in the eye, the, the little nudge underneath, underneath the table that communicates. Usually in my case, it was she was trying to say, would you shut up? You're putting your foot in your mouth. It was a little thing, folks. Uh, here I am exposing our secrets. It was a little thing, but... Now, that didn't mean one thing to you, but ask her what it meant. Knock three times. It was a song we used to have when we were uh, before Christ. 
okay? And y'all know nothing about it. But all you had to say was just tap somebody three times, just knock something three times. And, and while nobody else in the room understood what it was, the one that knew you the best automatically knew that there was messages being sent because there were the closeness of those little, tiny, intimate things. You get to know the good about somebody, but you get to know the bad about somebody. You get to know the times of laughter, but you also know the times of sorrow. Because when you marry somebody, it's for better or for worse, in sickness and in health. It's whether you're rich or whether you're poor. I'm saying I'm going to stick with you. It does not matter what life throws our way. We're living in a different day now. People say one thing, mean a different thing. They stand up before the pulpit. They stand up before the preacher. And they say vows and they lie all the way through it. They say forever But what they meant is, until you mess up my little dreams or my little plans. Until you disappoint me. And then it's it's over. Can I hear an amen? amen? Until it gets tough. Until it gets rough. But let me tell you something, friend. That's not reality. Reality is... It's not all a rose garden. It's not all petals and smells. There's thorns that go along with it. There's work that goes along with it. There's effort that goes into it. There's prices to be paid if you're going to enjoy the beauty that comes on the other side. Don't get me started. I'm starting to feel the Holy Ghost in this house because what we so many times want is we want God to give us the loaves and the fishes. We want God to give us the miracles. We want God to give us a get out of jail free card. We want God to give us everything that we want and we're using God for selfish purposes. And God, if you don't do what I want you to do, I'm out of here. You don't love him like you ought to love him. Because if you loved him, if he took it all away, it wouldn't mean one thing to you. It's just Jesus. Jesus is all I want. I gotta, I gotta get it through you. I gotta get it into you because there's something about a relationship with Jesus. When you surrender everything, that's when God can reveal His greatest things to you. Why should He tell you the secrets of the universe if you're not willing to study? If you don't earn it, you don't value it. Why should he paint you a picture of the greatest things that he's ever got out there? I'm fixing to walk down that aisle right now. I'm I'm talking to you because I'm tired of shallowness in the house of God. I'm tired of people that are just coasting along. They're riding the the waves. They're riding the canoe, but they're not really doing anything with purpose. I, I would to God that we would dig in and get to know him. Paul Price's cry for the last couple of decades, a few decades of his life. Oh, that I may know him. Taken out of Paul's writings in the book of Galatians, chapter 3 and verse 10. The cry that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, shaped by his death, shaped by the cross, compressed into a lifestyle that was there because of Calvary. And there's a lot of people that want to know him and the wonderful things. 
but they don't want to know him in his sufferings. They want his power. They want signs, wonders, and miracles. But they're not saying, God, not my will, but thine be done. I ended up talking to the Sunday school class this morning, and I didn't say everything I wanted to say. And there's, I, I finally had to quit and told them I'm going to have to come back one more time to get that last couple of points in, uh, which may take me an hour. But I ended up talking to them about destiny. You see, our youth got so much potential wrapped up inside of them. Their life is still a very empty canvas. They think right now my life is full of darkness. My life is full of misery. My life makes no sense. But they don't realize that the artist many times paints in the backdrop before he starts putting in the details. Before he starts dropping in the beauty and the pieces there. He's got to make sure that the things that are going to give the right background that is going to sit upon that, he paints those parts in first. And we wonder when we're young, God, what's going to happen in my life? What's, what's it all about? Well, all what you've got to do is you've got to surrender the brush to the artist's hands. And when you surrender yourself with him, I'm telling you, when he finishes, he will produce a masterpiece in your life. So filled with potential and possibility. But you'll not do it by determining what this masterpiece is going to look like. I hate to confess it, but if I was the artist, I'm afraid my, my art pieces would look like Mr. Potato Head. They'd look so rudimentary and so plain because I don't have that skill. That's not where my artistic abilities lie. But when you put it into the hands of somebody that knows what he's doing, he can blend things. He can put just a little tiny thing in there. I don't know if anybody else saw it, but I, I saw somebody take two pieces of bread the other day. Anybody else see that? They, they took a palette knife, and they took vegetables, and they began to mash those vegetables together. Did you see it? Oh, it was amazing. And they began to paint flowers out of food on that bread and they they laid it out with the leaves and they laid it out with a beautiful orchid and they made all of those things and they they even took certain pieces of fruit and put it together and squished it up through a strainer and pulled it off and laid it in there so that the little pestles on the on the on the bloom was out there so beautiful and it was so pretty and then they ate it But I mean, it's just art. Do you know that God intended for your life to be beautiful? But in order for him to do what he wants to with you, he's going to have to carry you through some places that you call suffering. He's got to put the right spirit inside of you. He's got to put the right nature inside of you. You are the sum of your parts, and what you don't realize yet is that God allows some things to go in through, on through your life so that later on those things are going to be the very thing that God uses to minister, help, strengthen, touch other people. I wish I could start naming some things right now. Some of you regret some junk that you got into, and the mercy of God says, you know, I can take that. I can take that bleak color and that time in your life, and I can turn it around and use it to when somebody else is walking through that very same thing. You can be such a blessing to them. So stop cursing the days when you made, mercy, uh, made dumb things. Just thank God for the mercy that took you and put you into his kingdom, and uh, he's got you here for such a time 
as this. Just surrender yourself and God, I want, I want to have a walk with you and I want to have a relationship with you. I'm not preaching a deep message. I'm just deep preaching a message to you that you need to long to be with him and to know him and understand him. That when he talks to you on a daily basis, you recognize his voice. When he moves on you in a certain way, you understand what God is doing. That it doesn't take a Sunday night service for your sensitivity in the spirit to get where it ought to be. You ought to walk with him on a daily basis until you know him. If you can't endure his suffering, you won't be there for his resurrection. She was in a park in New York City. Fanny Crosby sat on a park bench and talked to a friend, a fellow songwriter by the name of John Swinney. And they were discussing concepts, things. I don't know how old she was at this point. She died very frail after having produced somewhere around a hundred songs in her lifetime, many which are still in our song books today. She was sitting there and they were discussing and Mr. Swinney asked him, asked her the question, said Fanny, do you think you'll recognize Jesus when you get to heaven? She said, you wonder if this old lady who has been blind all of her life will be able to recognize her master and her savior. She said, well, I've given it a lot of thought. And she said, I don't think I'll have a problem. She said, I'm going to look around and I'm going to find somebody that I believe looks like my savior. And she said, I'm going to walk up to him and I'm going to ask him, can I see your hands? The only man-made thing that is going to be in heaven is his scars. The only thing. And she said with my glorified eyes, I'm going to walk up and say, can I see your hands? And it was the next day that John Swinney and Fanny Crosby sat down and began to write the song, I shall know him, I shall know him. As redeemed by his side, I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the prints of the nails in his hands. You hear me tonight. You better beware of a Christ that does not know suffering. Jesus said in the last days, there's going to be false Christs. There's going to be those that say I'm here and that I'm there. And there's going to be those that will appear and you better pray that you love truth and so that when an error shows, oh, I'm in the Holy Ghost right now. When a spirit of deception shows up and tests you, you better be able to know whether it's of God or not of God. Say what you want to about Lazarus, uh, about, about uh, um, Thomas. Say what you want to about Thomas. Thomas knew one thing. There's one thing I'll know about him. And there's going to be some scars. There's going to be some wounds. There's going to be the evidence of the crucifixion. They're not going to dupe me with a, with a duplicate. They're not going to fool me with some imposter. The only way I'll trust him is whether I know he has suffered. And when they try to offer you a Christianity 
without the cross. When they try to offer you a walk with God without suffering, without any difficulty, without any sacrifice, you better run from it. You better avoid it because it's a spirit of deception. And if you embrace it, it'll feel like truth to you. It'll feel like the absolute truth. But the only way that you'll know the difference between that old stinking devil out there and the real Savior and Messiah is he knows what suffering is all about. I'm preaching to you tonight because there is a lure, one of the greatest pulls in this world right now is a pull away from the commitment to the things that we suffer. You don't have to live holy like that. You, 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 know, you can fit in and be a witness and a testimony. Holiness is not that important. You, you know, that was for our parents' day. That's just the way society was back then. It, you, you don't have to go to church that much. You don't have to go that often. And it won't be long until once a month is sufficient. One lady said, one lady said to him, uh, to, the, to the preacher, said, I'm going to quit coming to church because every time I do, you sing one of two songs. He said, what's that? She said, either the little star of Bethlehem or he arose. All right, that went over your head. It's either Christmas or Easter. She's going to quit because that's all that they sing, is those two songs over and over and over. Little by little, what's convenient for you will take away from your commitment to him. I wished, I wished I had a magical way, not magical, but I wished in the Holy Ghost that God would give you young people a revelation. Peer pressure pushes you. This world throws false teaching at you, ungodly teaching at you. I, I, I'm so, I have trepidation about you going back to a public school. I, I, res, I, I don't like that you have to go there. Because I don't want them teaching you things that are contrary to godliness, to the word of God. Something deep inside of you, from our kids in grade school all the way up, there's something that's got to get a hold of you that says, I love God, and no one's going to take that away from me. I got the Holy Ghost when I was six, seven years old. God did something for me, and I'm not going to trade that for anything. The only way I'm going to trust it is that the prints of the nails are in there. The only way I'm going to trust those arms circling me is to know he crucified, he was crucified, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. I'm not going to trust it. If it promises that there's a life without pain, So God called me back to a place of commitment. Called me back to a place where essentials matter. Church, we've got to fall completely in love with Him. God, whatever the package entails, I'll go with you. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Then pick up your cross. Follow me. Pick up your cross. I'm, I'm offering to you the crucified life tonight. 
I'm offering you Calvary, not just as a one-time thing, but something you embrace. How much do you love him? How much are you willing to surrender over to him? Because only in the act of surrender can God do with you what he wants to do in your life. This altar is open. I would like to see as many as possibly could to come up here. Some of you elders, if you can make your way close to the front, then perhaps one of these young people can saddle up to you and ask you to pray for them. Pray that God would give them stamina. Pray that God would give them courage. Pray that God would help them to have patience. In Jesus' name, to never surrender the dream, the call. I love him too much to fail him now. Love him too. at your feet. Too much.
truly believe after hearing pastor's message 
that the Lord gave us a direct word from him this Sunday. Man, Pastor was in the back. He had no clue what was said this morning. Pastor said that if he painted a, if he painted a picture, it would look like Humpty Dumpty. But in the master's hand, it would be a masterpiece. Anthony got up here this morning and said, in his hand, in his pottery class, it was just a work, it was just nothing. But when that instructor began to work the clay, in the master's hand, it was a piece that was worth, that had value. I believe that God spoke to this church today on what we needed to hear. Amen. Let's lift our hands one more time as we're being dismissed. God, thank you for everything that you've done this evening, God. Thank you for speaking to us this morning, this evening, God. Thank you for allowing us to come and fellowship with one another, worship and praise your name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. In your mighty name we pray, God. Keep us safe and we go on our way to our jobs, God. Give us strength, God. Give us liberty. Let us be a witness to the people around us, God, this coming week. Oh, bring us back into your house, God, on Tuesday and Wednesday, Lord. Our kids are going to be going back to school this week. So if you are going to school, um, whether it's barely starting your first year or if you're continuing on all the way up to college, if we can have our young people come up to the front, please. And then we're going to have the elders, parents, please gather around those children. Just ask God to keep his hand upon them. I know Pastor already said it, but it is so crucial in this day and age that we live in now that we ask God to be with them, to strengthen them, to keep his hand upon them. If we can all, church elders, if we can please gather around these young people. They are facing some things in this world that we, some of you guys could have never imagined. And they need some prayer warriors. They need some church people on their side. So can we just all gather around them in this house and just ask God to be with them. God, you see each and every young person right now, God. We're asking God that you would take control, God. Oh, God. Have your way, oh God. church come on church let's touch the throne of grace on their behalf come on let's intercede for these young people right now Jesus, God.